Hey everyone, welcome back to NOISO. It's been a bit. Today we're diving into a device that has been a favorite of mine for several years, and this iteration keeps the tradition, the Dell XPS 14. It's the prettiest laptop I've ever used, just like its 13-inch plus brother that I reviewed last year, but bigger. But does the beauty match the performance? Well, let's talk about it. Excitingly, this is the first XPS that Dell has ever sent me, and I am super excited to check it out. But just so you know, they are seeing this video at the same time as you, and they had no bearing on, the, on my opinions and my review of this device. Let's get into it. Let's start with where Dell XPS line has always excelled in the design. On the outside, it kind of looks like any other XPS. It's sleek, it's professional, it's high-end, albeit there's nothing that truly stands out. You could set this laptop next to any other XPS for the last five years with a closed lid, and it'd be tough to pick out it from the crowd. But I'd say that there's nothing a Mac user can laugh at here. It's a very, very premium, simple, straightforward design. Now, this laptop has a very similar footprint to the 14-inch MacBook Pro that I've reviewed before, but with a little bit of a twist. While the MacBook Pros have brought back this squared frame on the edges, the XPS features this tapered edge that makes it feel a lot slimmer and more portable, even if the two laptops weigh relatively similar. One issue that I've experienced with the XPS in terms of design is the inability to easily open it up. There's no lip on the front of the lid that's easy to grab, and so I kind of need to stick out my fingernail into it in order to lift it smoothly and comfortably. The inside of the XPS 14 is where it really shines. The interior is just absolutely gorgeous. If you ask someone in 2014 to design a laptop of the future, I wouldn't be surprised if this is what they did. They would say microscopic bezels, maybe an invisible trackpad, and a keyboard where every single key sits completely flush with the rest of the keyboard deck. Oh, and um, rather than a function row, you know, maybe some lights or something could be cool. Now, one thing I'll mention before getting to the keyboard and trackpad in terms of experience is the ergonomic feel of actually using this keyboard is not the best because of the design of the front of the device, which is just a little bit too sharp for me. Whenever I rest my palms on it, it has a tendency to just create red bruises or lines in my hands and I'd rather it to be slightly more curved and comfortable. The trackpad, I'd say, is a visual delight, and it has a relatively accessible haptic click. It's not a physical depression like a lot of other trackpads from the past. Now, it's large enough that I'm never searching for it, and frankly, I've had zero issues with palm rejection while typing, which often plagues me when I'm using large trackpads. This one, I never felt like I missed it when I was trying to use it. It's always exactly where you need it to be, even if you can't visibly see it. Now, unlike the 13-inch model, the keyboard doesn't have an edge-to-edge -edge layout, and it's flanked by a pretty good set of speakers. Now, while I'm generally adapted to the layout and the spacing of this, it's still not my favorite keyboard to type on, and honestly, going back to islanded keyboards, more traditional islanded keyboards, feels more at home. And then let's not forget about the function row, or lack thereof. Dell probably interviewed or, or tested with a lot of users that probably never use the function row in its more traditional F key sense. Instead, most people probably just use it to control brightness or volume or anything alike. But unfortunately, the function row is critical in my use case and several use cases for me. I frequently use keyboard shortcuts in Google Chrome. I only use keyboard shortcuts in Excel. I use keyboard shortcuts in Visual Studio Code, all that leverage the function row, the traditional F keys. And if you're constantly or consistently touching up there and searching for that key, then it will be a big step down from having a traditional F key of row, like actual physical keys. I always have to go searching for the right button because it is not positioned in a place where I like easily expect it to be, and there's no f sort of physical feedback like vibration or anything to confirm that I hit the key that I want. So I'm going searching. And so outside of that, the design and layout of the keyboard is almost perfect. And then there's one other issue, the Copilot key. Now, if you're not familiar with the Copilot key, I shouldn't be surprised considering Microsoft just actually started implementing Copilot keys across all Windows devices this year. What used to be the right control key or possibly the menu key 
is now almost universally the Copilot key. And if you are someone who accesses Microsoft or Windows Copilot frequently, which I'm not sure I know anyone who does that, then maybe it's beneficial. Maybe you're someone who doesn't use the right control key all that often. But for me, again, I'm someone who uses the right control key. Anytime I'm trying to access a keyboard shortcut with one hand with solely my right hand, I use the right control key. And then anytime I'm trying to quickly right click on the screen, I will use the menu hotkey, which by the way, it's called menu. It's currently accessed on many laptops like this device with a function and then right control, or in this case, copilot button. The good news is, is I found a way to remap the copilot key back to a right control key or a menu button, which I will be releasing in a separate video. But for a spoiler, you use something called Microsoft Power Toys, a Microsoft product to do so. In terms of ports, we have two Thunderbolt ports on one side and one along the other, along with a headphone jack and a micro SD card reader. Now, while it's nice to see that micro SD card reader, it's a good feature to have for, for example, a videographer or a YouTuber or a photographer, I would have personally preferred a full-size USB-A port. I've enjoyed seeing several devices, including the MacBook Pro, adding back full-size HDMI ports, but you don't have anything like that here. So you'll need to dongle if HDMI is a necessity and if USB-A is a necessity. The port selection isn't a deal breaker, but it does leave a bit to be desired for such a high-end premium laptop like this. Now let's talk the display. Now Windows OEMs have been teasing or like using OLED displays in laptops here and there for nearly half a decade, and while it's not completely new, this one feels like peak display. Fans of the channel know I generally prefer matte displays for their lack of reflection, but this glossy display has an anti-reflective coating that is I'd say the next best thing. It's stunning to look at, and honestly, it's better than any matte display I've ever used by far in terms of quality. Watching content on this 3.2K display is just an absolute joy. Coding in VS Code, video editing in Premiere Pro, watching YouTube and Netflix, and even a bit of gaming, it all looks fantastic. Now, one frustration that I have is the lack of a lower resolution option that still retains touch and non-reflective features. On Dell's website, you have the option to go for a 1080p-esque model, but that 1080p model unfortunately does not have touch, which is quite a bummer. I personally don't feel the need for such a high resolution display on a device this size, and I would happily trade it for a bit of less cost and maybe battery savings but not without giving up touch functionality, which I still think is pretty critical on Windows devices. Oh, and a small Windows complaint, not Dell focus, but how are we still dealing with scaling issues on older apps in 2024? If you experience something like this, and I experienced it in PG Admin, it gets really very frustrating, but I found that many apps use Control Zero, which basically rescales an application completely. So it's a nice trick to have, something that I figured out, but anytime you have a high resolution screen like this, it will happen quite regularly. Now under the hood of this model, we have a high end core ultra seven processor, 32 gigs of DDR5X RAM and an Nvidia RTX 4050 laptop graphics card. And frankly, there's nothing really I threw at this processor that it couldn't handle. Now, however, some of you might be disappointed to hear that the RAM is soldered and not upgradable. By the way, this is a space constraint typically. It seems like SODEMs, you know, the old way of installing RAM in laptops, are generally going the way of the dinosaur. Both Dell and Samsung have proposed alternative solutions for upgradable, low profile and high bandwidth memory, but it'll be some time before we start seeing those, that kind of unicorn in the wild. Now, thankfully the SSD is upgradable and it's pretty easy to get to. You just take off a few screws on the back and install it with a new version of Windows. It's very simple. Now, while this isn't a very dedicated gaming machine, I found that the graphics horsepower can be very, very helpful for older games, older AAA games, and some more modern titles on lower resolution settings. So if you want a game on this machine, it is an option. Now, as for the battery life, in my testing, I've been getting around five hours on out-of-the-box balanced performance settings with low screen brightness, which was a bit disappointing. 
Now, switching to efficiency mode got me closer to eight hours of usage per charge, and I didn't feel like the lesser performance was significantly impacting my you know, daily use. But generally, this is not a stamina champion. That's okay for me. Typically, I'll have it pretty close to a charger through most of the day. Five hours can get me through you know, most of a workday, even if I'm not right by my desk. In terms of who this device is for, there's no doubt that this is an absolutely fantastic machine, but who is it really for? Now, I know many XPS fans that will spend north of $2,000 on a high-end XPS and keep it for five to seven years. This device seems catered directly for those people. The 14-inch size, while new to the XPS line, I think it's pretty similar to the actual footprint of the XPS 13 from about a decade ago. So really, it's just a bigger screen in the same size package. In my mind, nowadays, 13 inches is quite not large enough for most multitasking, but on the other hand, 15 to 16 inch devices feel pretty unwieldy. Unwieldy? And so 14 inches is this perfect in-between. And so if I were to choose, this is the model that I would go for. But I am open, Dell, to seeing the additional options out there if you want to send them my way. To be honest, this is an almost perfect device for me. I love it. It's such an incredibly designed device. It feels so premium and so nice to use. It's got all the specs I could possibly need with one caveat, and that's the keyboard. I really wish they had a physical function row, and maybe in the future Dell will revert and start making physical function rows. But maybe for you, if you are not personally that bothered by a you know digital function row, then this might be an excellent device. It is certainly a premium device, and that's what's reflected in its premium pricing. It's beautifully designed, performs exceptionally well, and it offers a display that's just very hard to beat. Now, while there are a few quirks and compromises, overall, it's a solid choice for anyone looking for a high-end laptop that balances nice portability for a 14-inch model and a lot of power. Now, if you enjoyed this review and want more detailed tech insights, don't forget to hit that like and the subscribe button. Thank you for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one. See ya.